So let's talk a little bit about ozonolysis. Now, we're not going to study the detailed mechanism of ozonolysis, nor even really delve into the first step where ozone adds to the uh, double bond and forms an ozonide. Uh, you can read about that in your textbook. Mostly what I expect you to do is to recognize this combination of reagents, ozone followed up by a reducing agent, at least for alkenes, and then, as we'll see in a moment, a different reagent for alkynes, and um, recognize that th what these reagents do is they essentially act like scissors that cut right across the double or triple bond in the case of alkynes, and it essentially separates two pieces um, or at least uh, severs the, the double bond completely um, between those two carbons, but it doesn't remove the double bond nature from the carbon. Instead, it inserts essentially two oxygens, one at each, uh, one to each carbon. So for example, we'll take a look at this uh, problem right here. So you have this double bond right here and you put it in the presence of ozone. And then in the case of alkenes, you typically use some reducing agent. It could be zinc or dimethyl sulfide. And there's others too, but for the most part, if you just remember these, I'll probably just use, probably just use dimethyl sulfide, but either of those will work. And so essentially you just cut it in half and you just separate them into two pieces. You know, and initially, if you look at it, it looks like the same thing. It looks like the double bond, but the, the bond is stretched out. But essentially, it's because the ozone comes in, it chops it in half, and replaces two oxygens in place of where they were once bonded to each other. Now, each of these double that were once double bonded carbons, they're still double bonded, but now they're double bonded each to an oxygen atom. Everything else in the molecule remains the same. One, two, three carbons, one, two, three carbons, one, two carbons, one, two carbons. And that's pretty much it for ozonolysis. That is what it does, and you need to be aware of it. For alkynes, there's a slight difference. Um, the main thing is because they're triple bonds, which means you're cutting off, you're cutting across three bonds, you need to still have three bonds, but once again, they're connected to oxygens. Now, in the case of alkenes, you replace uh, each of the double bond, uh, each side of the double bond that you cut into two pieces with an oxygen atom. For alkynes, you add two oxygen atoms, one of which is a double bonded oxygen, and the other one is a single bonded oxygen with an H added to it. Essentially, you form carboxylic acids. Now, it depends though if you have an internal alkyne or a terminal alkyne. In the case of an internal alkyne where each end of the alkyne has an R group on it, you end up with two carboxylic acids. You know, right here I have an example where they're methyls. Let's just reduce it to a generic form. So you've got two different R groups there. Then you end up with two carboxylic acids, one with an R group and one with the R prime group. For terminal alkynes, you essentially get the same thing for the side that has an R group on it. Here you take a cyclohexane with, um, that's connected to an alkyne. You end up with that same cyclohexane, but that carbon right here, this carbon right here, it ends up as a carboxylic acid, but this carbon right here ends up as CO2. So it ends up as C double bond O, C double bond O which is CO2, carbon dioxide. Once again, it is a temptation for the student mind to say, I don't get it because I don't know how it happened. I don't know how it happened, if you mean mechanistically. I don't know the mechanism for this myself because you know, I'm a, technically a physical, uh, physical chemist, um, but I've also been trained in organic, but mostly for sophomore organic and teaching sophomore organic. So I haven't really delved into the deeper mechanisms of more advanced reactions. So for sophomore organic, we never really learned the detailed mechanism of how or and you know how this carbon ends up with uh, two oxygens that are double bonded to it. But it does have to do with if you think about it, you can't have you couldn't you can't have a molecule that has a single bonded oxygen with an OH on it and then an H. There's no molecule that's known to be like that structure. So, in the end, that is what you get.
as if it's a terminal alkyne, you get carbon dioxide and a carboxylic acid that has the same R group as the alkyne. And if it's an internal alkyne, you get two carboxylic acids, each with the R groups that were part uh, that were on the two sides of the alkyne. <clears throat> and then another special property of ozonolysis is if you have multiple bonds, it reacts with all of them. Now, maybe that's a hindrance too, but it's something to be aware of. So every double bond in the molecule will undergo the oz uh, ozonolysis scissors, quote unquote. And so in this case, the way you figure out the products then is you, you know, imagine that you're cutting both of them. And so the products are going to be this piece right here, which is now going to just redraw the part that's on this side of the double bond. So it would look like this. But remember, what goes at the top of this double bond on, on this piece? NO. Same thing here, double bond. And then this is a little tricky. When you have ones like this, so you've cut both of these two pieces. So you pull this whole thing out and I draw it here. But once again, what goes to these two ends after undergoing the scissoring effect of ozonolysis? You replace on each of these an O. And then finally this piece right here it falls off like this. And once again, NO. So these three products form when you make this dialkene, this diene, as we'll learn they're called more in chapter 16 in OCHEM2, this diene undergoes ozonolysis. These three products are formed. The last thing I want to talk about before getting into retrosynthesis is I want to remind you about some of the reductions you should have been watch you watched or learned about in the previous video as well as in your reading of alkynes, the reductions of alkynes. First of all, they get the full reduction, and it's very similar to the reduction of an alkene. You have hydrogen gas in the presence of a metal catalyst. And in the case of just a pure metal catalyst, plat platinum, palladium, nickel, etc., cetera, um, you, what you essentially do is you completely reduce it. You don't stop at the alkene. It does technically form first, the alkene that you would imagine, but it quickly itself, because that is what alkenes do in the presence of hydrogen gas and a, ca a, ca a metal catalyst, it further undergoes reduction and forms um, this fully uh, reduced, the triple bond is completely gone and you replaced it with four hydrogens. Now, what about, what if you wanna stop at the alkene? So is there a way to do that with a, just with hydrogen gas and a catalytic metal? There is, but what you have to do is you have to poison the metal catalyst. And we'll talk a little bit about the poisoning of the metal catalyst in lecture. But essentially what happens is you find a catalyst that's a poisoned one. And one of the most common ones, most famous of all is Linlar's catalyst. I don't expect you to know memorize or even look up and identify what Linlar's catalyst is. Most organic chemists just put Linlar's, uh, Linlar's catalyst here. Um, but it is a certain mixture of palladium and some other compounds uh, mixed together. And that acts as a, as a poison catalyst. And like I said, we'll talk more about what that means uh, kinetically and the reaction diagram and so forth uh, and why we get the product we do or I should say why we stop at the product we do uh, in lecture. But the essential result is you don't further oxid, uh, excuse me, you don't further reduce the double bond. And so you stop at the alkene. And in the case of, a, of, of the Linlar's catalyst, because you're, you're transforming the alkyne into the alkene using a metal catalyst on a solid surface, very similar to what we talked about, in alkene reductions, when you use a metal catalyst, the H's add to the same side. You know, when we talked about uh, reducing an alkene with a metal catalyst, we, we pointed out that they added sin. Now, we don't really talk about sin or anti here because we're stopping at a double bond. What we do is we essentially added them cis. 
we form the cis alkene. Um, oops, that's not alkene. It should be alkene. Excuse me. We form the cis alkene. Because the two hydrogens, which are resting on the catalyst, just like we talked about for uh, the reduction of an alkene, the two hydrogens are resting on this metal catalyst when the alkyne comes along and has them bloop, bloop, add to the same side on that metal catalyst. So that's how we get a cis or Z alkene from a triple bond, uh, from an alkyne, a triple bonded carbon. So how then do we get a trans alkene or an E alkene. Well, we have to use a completely new kind of a uh, type of reagent that we once again, it was mentioned before uh, in the previous video with Dr. Bay. Um, it's known as a dissolved metal reduction. And it's called that because you take typically an alkaline metal and more specifically sodium, and you dissolve it in pure concentrated liquid ammonia. So it is a pretty, gnarly caustic um, reagent to work with. It's got pure concentrated ammonia uh, and then some sodium metal dissolved in it like that, which is a pretty reactive thing. So it's pretty, uh, pretty corrosive and dangerous to work with, but it's very effective in giving us what we want, a trans product uh, of an alkene from an alkyne. And that is all I'm gonna talk about here in the video. In lecture, we'll go over the mechanism. You see, the mechanism is why you get a trans product. And the mechanism is also going to be our first look at mechanisms that involve radicals, because I will talk about, I will mention this here in the video. The way a sodium, now keep in mind, this is not sodium like we've seen it before. A lot of times we've seen sodium, like sodium amide, in which case this is an ionic compound made up of sodium cations and amide, NH2 minus, anions. That is not the sodium here, even though if you, you know, if your eyes blur a little bit, you might think it's like, you know, get confused. What? It's like the same thing. It's not. Here, the, you know, if it's not clear, this is a comma here because these are two substances. This is pure sodium metal, and this is liquid ammonia. And in the sodium metal, if you don't remember from GCAM, it is a single, it is, it is represented by a single atom of sodium, you know, at the fundamental level. And that sodium atom has one valence electron on it. And as you learned about in general chemistry, that one valence electron is very, very reactive and wants to completely be stolen. It wants to be, um, it wants to undergo oxidation and lose its electron, sodium that is. It's very, um, it is very reactive and wants to very much undergo oxidation. That is why it's a good reducing agent because it wants to be oxidized so badly, it will force other things to undergo reduction by giving away its one electron. How it gives away that one electron and what the intermediates look like, we'll talk about in the mechanism, which is kind of the key to why it gives this alkene product that is trans. So the, main, so the main thing for now is be sure not to confuse the strong, very strong, mind you, but strong base sodium amide for sodium dissolved in ammonia. They cause two different types of reactions. If you recall from our previous lectures, sodium amide very often is used for you know, uh, eliminations and double eliminations to make alkynes. Sodium with ammonia is used to reduce alkynes to alkenes.